Good morning. Come on, come. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. You know, I'm very lucky today. It's not only by being in Amsterdam, not only to be in front of all these tremendous people from the financial services industry, but I'm kind of like the, the speaker sandwich. I am between Chris Skinner and Brett King. Now, that's not a real envious position because the good news is you may not leave because you want to see Chris or you came because you saw Brett. The good news is I got to keep that level high. It's kind of like being the second comedian in a comedian thing or a second singer in an entertainment venue. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to bring you a little bit back to earth from where Brett was. I'm not going to talk about what's going to happen in the far future, as Brett does so well. I'm going to talk about what you have to do today, what you had to have done yesterday, and what you have to do tomorrow in a pragmatic sense. Why do I come from a pragmatic background? Because I've been in the banking industry longer than many of you have been alive. I've probably been in the industry as long as probably almost anybody in this room, over 40 years. Started my career in a bank in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, moved on to different financial institutions, and then I moved into direct and database marketing where I served only financial institutions. Basically, I got in a rut that I couldn't get out of. At 55 years old, and we won't talk about how many years that was, I decided that I had to expand what I was doing or else I would become irrelevant or people would think I would come, become irrelevant. So I started writing for the financial brand and bought the digital bank report. What that did is it allowed me on a daily basis to interact with people to find out what is going on in the marketplace and how can I help others do better. Kind of like a pay it backwards scenario where I share information through the financial brand, my banking transform podcast, and the digital bank report. I try to share insights that let bankers do better. Now, it can be a lifetime profession. It's something I don't have to worry about losing my job because unfortunately, unlike the people in this room, there are a lot of banks that don't do what they need to do for the future. So I kind of have that endless stream of need out there, whether or not people listen or not. I have one major take, two major takeaways today. One, nothing matters if you don't have leadership that's ready to embrace change. You can buy all the technology in the world, but if you don't have the leadership that can implement it, that gives you the runway to fail or just take some risks, you will not succeed. Secondly, it doesn't matter how small or how big your organization is, the pathway to success is going to include partnerships and collaborations. There are people all around you that do what you do better than you do in certain categories. Stop trying to be the smartest person in the room and let other smart people be in the room to make you look better. Those are the two major things. It's why I'm here today is to share some of the things that are going on in this industry that have never been done before. I'm going to reference this more than a couple of times. If you think the industry or the world is standing still and you're saying everything's an incremental change, remember the date November 30th of 2022. That is the day that OpenAI introduced ChatGPT to the world. And the world embraced it in a way unlike anything before. Different than the iPhone, different than the EarPods, different than Tesla. What it does, it has the potential to change everything. What was unique about the introduction of ChatGPT, they introduced it on the consumer level. You cannot go through a week or even a day of newscasts, of podcasts, of social media without hearing something about conversational or contextual AI. It is going to change everything we know about intelligence, about learning, and about teaching. We're right now at a time where change is happening faster than ever before, and it will not happen this slowly again. So if you think you can wait and catch up, that is virtually impossible because the marketplace is moving faster than you can keep up. The connectivity across the world between each other is more than just your connectivity with your phone, it's the connectivity in supply chains. The connectivity between what you want to buy, 
what the company that's making it makes, what the company who packages it packages, and the company that delivers it delivers it. The span between your thoughts around what you want to order and what is delivered to your home or business is shrinking because of AI, because of data, and because of technology. What is interesting about that is that is setting the tone for what's going on in the entire financial services industry. Consumers don't want to wait to get what they want. They don't want it to be the same as everyone else in this room. They don't want an account opening process that takes 15 minutes and the bank thinks they're doing it digitally. How many of you have an Apple credit card? Okay, Apple credit card. Just to show you how long it takes to get an Apple credit card, you go, I want an Apple credit card. It comes up. It shows you everything about you. It says, is this right? It doesn't make you enter anything. One click, yes. It is because they're getting it from my phone. They're getting it from other sources. It then says, what are the last four digits of your digital identification number, your government ID? Four digits. So that's now we're up to five clicks. They're already starting to run the credit bureau to find out if you're worthy. They then say, how much money do you make in a year? That is just a stall tactic. They don't need that. They get it from the credit bureau. The reason they ask it is to verify in a know your customer manner, is this really the person who's holding the phone and applying for the credit card? So now I have done four more, or five more, six more strokes. Depends on how much money I'm making. I go, connect. And you go, okay, what are you going to ask next? And it goes, you've been approved for X thousands of dollars. And the first thing you say, excuse me, as Brett said for the language, but holy shit. You know, I'm sorry, but I was thinking I would go through the process and get out of it. It then says, do you want a metal card? Now, I don't want to use cards. And the last thing I need is another heavy card. Now, I'm sorry for those people I gave a heavy business card to today, but let it be known that I don't take, I've never taken that card out of my wallet, but I said yes. They said it'll be to you in three days. It was to me in two days in a little cardboard container. And instead of having me call a phone number and put in 16 digits to say, I want to authorize and start this card, it simply says, put your phone to the card. Done. So in fewer strokes than it takes most companies just to open and authorize a credit card, I've got one, I'm using it, I'm going forward with it. That's how fast change is happening. You know, the pandemic changed everything about the way consumers bank and what they expect from their bank. We're sitting at home. We're having to do multitasking. We have different priorities. And the last thing we want to do is do anything that takes time that I don't have. So I find new ways to do groceries. I find new ways to travel to visit my family through video conferencing. I mean, remember, the word Zoom meant nothing until COVID. And there's probably a per not a person in here, but probably not a person in the marketplace that doesn't know what either Facebook Live or Zoom means, including the seniors who are not digitally active. Branches were closed worldwide. People had to visit their branch through their mobile device. And they had to make their banking habits happen transactionally and interactively without being there in person. What happened is it raised the expectation levels of what everybody had to do. The tech companies did it very well. They connected with consumers. They made interactions more engaging. They made them faster. They made them simpler. They made them more empathetic. That is who's setting the tone for our industry. Don't look at other banks. Look at the tech companies. Look at OpenAI. Look at the companies that are doing things differently, because this is what we have to do. As we say, it's the end of banking as we know it. Brett brought that up. Not just in how we're doing banking, but the currencies, the accounts, the personalization. I don't want what everybody else is getting. I want my account. How many of you are work for a financial institution? Raise your hand. Good. That's Martin, Elena, very good. 
Great to see that many bankers in a room. It's hard to get nowadays. <laughs> but it's interesting because when we ask bankers, what's your attrition rate, they give me a very small number because you're not losing accounts. However, all of you, how many have closed a major banking relationship in the last five years? Major one. One. How many have opened any type of financial relationship in the last two years? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. And I probably could dig in deeper and find out, yeah, you did. The reality is we're not losing accounts or relationships. We're losing accounts. We're losing the depth. We have diversification of the relationship. I have a personal account with not only a big bank in the States, but I also have a really strong relationship with a company that does automatic savings called Acorns. I have a relationship with SoFi. I have a relationship with Chime. I'm starting to get a relationship with Revolut. On the business side, if you ask me, where's my business relationship? My business bank is another big bank in the States. My business relationship is with PayPal. They take all my receipts, they do all my disbursements, and because they know me and they understand me, they reward me by continuously offering me pre-approved short-term loans that I can access immediately. Now, I have a choice. If I want a loan, do I go to my traditional bank where I have to go into the branch to make an application? I'd have to wait for that application to be approved, hoping it's going to be approved, knowing there's probably some anomalies on my account that maybe they don't like, or they certainly don't understand what I do for a business. So they're going to ask me, wait, wait, you're a sole proprietorship, you sell subscriptions, but you also speak and you do that. We don't understand. So you go back and forth. You've got to put all kinds of letters together, letters that are actually handwritten or typed. Then I have to go through the approval process. And after approved, they're going to wait three to four days for, the, away, for me to be able to say, I don't really want the loan. That doesn't happen with PayPal. I'd be able to use the money immediately. So guess what? There's a value transfer. When that happens, I make the decision, do I want it now for this price or maybe not get it for this price? Most of us make this decision daily with automated shopping networks. We say, you know what, I want it today. And we stop looking at the financial side of what's going on. So when I'm talking about data, AI, open banking, what we're really talking about is how do you take the actual financial transaction out of the engagement and make it so it's a non-event because of the value you're delivering based on what you know about me. You know, what was possible, what is possible, with AI, data, open banking, and modern technologies. We've never been more connected. We've never had access to more data. We've never had a more powerful AI engine that can drive the answering my questions before I ask them. I'll give you an example. I, go to, I stay at Marriott hotels quite often. Many of the Marriott hotels I stay at have technology that tells them what temperature to set my room at before I show up. They know I'm at 69 degrees every single time. So I'm no longer having to worry about showing up in a room and having to be 74 degrees because they're trying to save money, or 62 degrees because they're trying to save money. 69. They know what kind of restaurants I go to, but that, I don't have to look at the restaurants. Why? Because of connected Connectivity with my Uber has already recommended what restaurants I should go to based on where I went to and where I went from. I'm getting recommendations from my hotels, from my travel company, from my, my uh, taxi company. What we want to look at is that the fact is, more than ever, we're not looking at the marketplace as a whole anymore. We're looking at individuals. We have the data. The problem is, many financial institutions don't like the risk of talking to me independently. So what happens? My business bank will send me an email. Dear Jim, good job. And then they talk about services I already have. And they finalize the email, that is a sales pitch, but in a nice benefit-driven way, with more lines of microtype about the, the things that they aren't representing 
than around what they are. This is going out to everybody, not to me. If they knew me, they wouldn't have to give me all those disclaimers. And they certainly wouldn't have to sell debit cards to me who I all, where I already have a debit card or a credit card. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about being able to pinpoint every single person and try to identify where they are in their life cycle. No longer is it good enough just to acquire a customer or to onboard a customer. A customer wants ongoing interaction from the point of first relationship to the day they die. And what's interesting, because the tech companies do this so well, if you don't stay in constant contact, we feel ignored. How many times have you stopped going to a restaurant, stopped buying from a retailer, stopped engaging with a friend, because they don't stay in contact, despite the fact that we have so many channels to choose from? And now, so many ways to do it through data, open banking, AI, and technology. You know, a good example of the type of relationship we're talking about are streaming services. I, I am, uh, Morton did give me the names. I couldn't pronounce them all. But every country has streaming services where you can select your entertainment for your TV, smart TVs. You connect your phone, you connect whatever it is. But it's interesting because we have two houses. We have a, a regular house up in northern Ohio in the States, and we have a smaller one, a much smaller one, down in warmer weather. Up north, we use AT&T and DirecTV, which is pick out what shows you want to record, and they'll record them. In the other one, we have a streaming service. They don't really allow you to, to save very much, and they don't allow you to pick them ahead of time. But what they do is they take what you've looked at, and they come back to you and tell you what you probably want to watch next. How many have a streaming service for watching movies, t entertainment things? It's kind of scary what they offer you, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I got into the habit last year of looking at how people make really exotic pools. I have no pool. I don't intend to get a pool, but it's a great show. All of a sudden, I'm getting more ideas on different pool shows. I didn't know there were so many networks that were doing pool shows. Now I'm doing flip and flop and housing, and you know, you always aspire to live someplace. You go, I'm not going to do any of this stuff, but it's really cool to know it. But what's interesting is every consumer was homebound for a long time. They have gotten really used to understanding the power of data to drive recommendations. They want the recommendations as to how do I go to what I want to see next without having to look for it. You know, we're probably asking each other much less frequently, you know, what shows do you watch? What shows do you like? We're letting our TV do it for us. We like a certain movie. We get other movies like it. We change a little bit and say, well, it wasn't that kind of movie. It was really this kind of movie or this kind of show. And then every night now, it puts up there at 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock at night what exactly I watch every night at 6 o'clock. I no longer have to search for it. What is also interesting, as I mentioned early, with OpenAI and ChatGPT, it's going to change everything. I'll be honest, I write for the financial brand at least once every week. I've revealed to some people, I use ChatGPT every week as a way to check what I'm writing. And don't let it write for me, but I say, I look at the article, and I put in there, what do I want to write about? And I ask it, what, what would it say about it? Just to make sure I'm not missing a point I should probably include in my article. I'm getting better and better at answering questions, asking questions. And those people who say ChatGPT or Bing or Google's, whatever they name theirs, suck, I ask the person, what did you ask it to do exactly? Hate to tell you, but in most cases, it's the person who asked the question that sucked. You ask a, a, a AI the wrong question, you're going to get a bad answer. Or, as Microsoft found out, if you input too much information to make it better, it can go rogue. Last week, it went out there and actually criticized people as if they were their worst enemy. Why? Because they inputted a lot of social media that wasn't well looked at. As Brett said, AI may help lose jobs. On the other hand, it may make more jobs. Who can ask good questions and put in good information? We also have the ability now 
to take data, AI, information around what I purchased in the past and help me with other purchases in unique ways we never thought possible. In the metaverse, you have the ability to shop for things and say, I want more things like this. And it can go through all the selection items. Now, in this example, this would not be me. They know enough about me to say, we're just going to show you different versions of black and red. It's the only thing Jim buys. My wife goes nuts. She goes, look at that closet. All this is black and red. Doesn't take much to tell that I don't listen to her very much on that item. Um, listen to her on everything else. But what's interesting is the selection process for what people want is changing and what they expect. So when I'm asking for a financial service, are you going to help me make that selection based on content and based on the information that you have available on me? You know, when we're talking about the stages going forward, the first stage that we want to look at, as we just talked about, was taking data from transactions. I'm sorry, this one is taking data from transactions to engagements. This is the second stage. What I mean by that is a lot of financial institutions are still saying we're trying to build a better customer experience. Customer experience is satisfaction. That's like saying I want to go to a restaurant that does not have rats. Not enough. The restaurants you love are those that create an experience around the eating, around the environment, around the entertainment. The consumer wants their financial services anytime, anywhere, any place, in an engaging format. I'm not going to spend 15 minutes on my iPhone to open an account. That's not good engagement. If, however, you open the account quickly and you immediately say, people like you look for this content, or what is the major financial challenge you have today, and you point me in a new direction, you're building interaction, you're building loyalty, you're building connectivity with a consumer that was impossible before. But the consumer expects it. And they don't expect it 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. They expect it 24-7, 365. And they expect it on every channel. How many of you have complained using social media about a flight, about a restaurant, about something you've in encountered? How many of you? Raise your hand. Why do you do that? Two reasons. One, you let them know I'm going to tell the world. Two, it's usually a faster channel. The problem is, if somebody responds to me on social media and I make a phone call, will the call representative realize I've complained and so they don't have to say, what can I help you with? They're going to so well know what they're going to help me with. I expect that. I expect my financial institutions to know me, understand me, and reward me. Not reward me with points necessarily, but it could. But reward me with attention. Or reward me with knowing who I am. Reward me with services that are directed in the way I want to go. Or content that helps me answer questions. It's like when you go to your hotel and you work with the concierge, and you say, here's what I want. I'm a big fan of Airbnb. Airbnb has a, con a component of their business called Airbnb Experiences. Whenever I get a place to stay with Airbnb, it offers me different experiences that are really phenomenal. If you haven't used it, but you've used Airbnb, you're missing out on a great thing. I've had dinners at people's houses in South Africa. I've done multiple urban artwork tours in Brazil, South Africa, Chicago, Illinois, New York, Brooklyn. And what's interesting is Airbnb is getting better and better at knowing what to recommend for me. These are usually one-to-one -one or one-to-three experiences. It's very cool to go to a country you've never been to and have them feed you the kind of food that they have. But what we're talking about here is engagement like no other time. These are mostly U.S. companies, I apologize. But each one of them has another level of engagement. How many of you use Clear? And that's mostly a U.S. thing. But Clear gets you through the line at the airport faster. Low level engagement, really good. Because it takes care of my time needs. You know, Zoom, we, we can talk Amazon. You have a, I think it's Bowl. Is it pronounced Bowl here? Uh, your online shopping network in, in uh, Amsterdam? 
What's neat is it used to be you'd have to scan through dozens and dozens of things when you're looking for shoes or T-shirt or whatever you want to call it. Now you don't get past the first page. Why? Because it understands you. More importantly, these warehouses do not stock stuff for everybody. These warehouses are only stocking what you're going to buy next. And the manufacturer is only making what you're about to ask for. And as I said earlier, that time lapse is getting quicker and quicker. You know, when we look at Uber and we talk about engagement, there's no company that I know that does better at engagement in certain ways. They build loyalty from the moment before you've ever used an Uber to the moment you try to leave Uber. Many of us have either recommended somebody or been recommended for $5, get $5 off a ride. That has generated 90% market share in most markets because I get $5 every time I refer to somebody or get referred. Then you get in the car and it builds loyalty because they have you connect all these different things. And I'm, you know, how many of you, just to check, how many of you have taken a taxi somewhere and gotten out of the taxi and go, oh crap, I forget, I gotta go back and pay? Because you're so used to not paying, not paying. But taking the financial relationship out of the relationship, that's embedded banking where I don't care or I'm not paying attention to what I'm spending. I no longer check to see what the price difference is between my online shopping relationship and a retail store is. I'm saving five minutes. I know it's going to be there. I know it can probably get there that day. What's interesting with Uber is the loyalty does not stop there. If you keep using it, you're going to get more and more points that you can use for rides. If that's not enough, American Express is also giving me so many dollars worth of rides every month. In addition, if I stop riding, they start offering me things to ride more. If you do what they ask you to do, loyalty is also built because they will let you choose the kind of car you want with different levels of cost differences. Pay attention. They have loyalty at every step of the process. And if it thought it stopped there, their drivers also built in a loyalty program. Their drivers who join their loyalty program get discounts on all the car services for their car, from oil to tires to mechanic work. They also get paid if they bring in new riders. They also get paid if they get better reviews. You know, some of these riders, you go, how do you keep this five star? Do you, like, before the person leaves the car, you put a gun to their head and say, you better give me five stars. Because nobody's that good with 22,000 rides they've done. Yeah, they are. Um, but in banking, even though Brett will tell you that branches are dead or dying, which is fine, there are certain branch networks that thrive in a way. Capital One in the United States is building a whole lot of coffee shop networks. Their branches are not your traditional branch. You walk in, you'd be hard pressed to know there's even a financial institution here. They have a single stand in many cases. that you go up and say, can I, can, I, can I get some help? And they take care of you. You can also buy coffee, buy donuts. You can use it as a workplace. What's interesting though, they're building branches to bring a branch or engagement experience to their massive credit card base. This is the same thing Chase is doing. Brett and I were having a conversation last night, and he brought up the fact that even though Chase says they're reducing branches, they're just reducing branches faster than they're building branches, because they're building branches where they didn't have them, reducing branches where they had too big of a penetration, and trying to serve a marketplace today that usually is their credit card market, that had no branch relationship. They're trying to expand relationships. They're trying to humanize the digital experience and build engagement. What's interesting is I was fortunate to speak at Capital One just about three weeks ago. Spoke to their entire retail unit supervisory network, about 200 people. I walk into the room and everybody's dancing. Now with each other, this dancing to music. I'm going, okay, this is not the banking conference I was waiting for. 
And it, it sur- I, I'm going to leave until you guys are done dancing because this isn't my dance. What was interesting is they all loved their jobs, and very few of them came from the banking industry. These came from retailers. They came from other engaging industries where they worked with customers on an ongoing basis. They realized they already have one of the best digital banks in the business in the United States. It's their job to humanize that experience. It's their job to take insights about the customers and about the prospects and use it to build better experiences. Convenience is now not how close is the branch down the street. It's how fast, how simple, and most importantly, how empathetic can my financial institution be to what my needs are. We're going through a tough time right now. Most people are not at conferences like we are. Many people are trying to figure out how to put food on their table or pay the next rent payment. They need our assistance. We cannot provide that assistance if we don't know who the customer is. We can't deliver it to those under-income people if we don't provide services that are less costly and have alternatives. Brett brought up WeBank earlier. What's amazing about WeBank is their average customer only generates about $30 a year in revenue. That does not pay for the service. Many customers generate less than that. The problem, or the benefit is, they got scale. Brett, how many uh, customers does WeBank have, roughly? 325 million. Oh, 325 million. How many, how many of you have 325 million customers? <laughs> What's interesting, Brett, Brett's been there as well, is at their control center. I walked into their control center, met with them, and they said, well, we want to show you what's going on in our bank, and they have a screen. They got four parallel cloud networks. Two of them are running their bank. Two of them are running test cells. And they start talking about the fact they go from ideation to implementation in 14 days. Okay, first show of hands. How many of you implemented something major in your financial institution in 14 days? In the States, we all, and most places in the industry, we all did that, by the way, for governmental assistance packages. We built platforms to deliver government assistance in three days, all being remote. However, that's not the norm. What was interesting about WeBank also, when they got rid of the clouded windows around, they said, and here's our customer care area. It's a bunch of computer terminals with no people. That's because they're not getting many complaints. What's interesting, we saw people come in and come out, they go, oh, those are our customer care people. They're actually the product managers for the product, and they can make decisions as to how to change a product for everybody on their own based on a customer input. So I tell a company, your account opening experience is too doggone long. They may not implement it in 14 days, but they're going to get on it. They're going to test on their cloud and implement it faster. We also have to realize that the next stage, the next stage is going from great reports to decentralize and democratize insights. The biggest pro- one of the bigger problems I see in the industry is financial institutions are getting better and better at knowing their customers, and they get to share within the product groups and in the data area so that if I ask within the bank, what does my customer base look like, they can show me. My good example is my, my personal bank, my big five bank. I know they know everything about me. The challenge is I don't know. They don't show me they know everything about me. What good is it if you don't deploy against it? Except for great reports. We're seeing more and more financial institutions sharing data insights across the organization for better services, better back office, better automation, and most importantly, better engagement. If we're opening accounts digitally, how are you onboarding now? Because it's not nearly as effective digitally as it was when we did it in person. How about giving the insights to your teller staff, your branch staff, or your product managers that aren't doing as much interaction and have them interact and build onboarding relationships with the insights we're providing them? If we do that, we'll make the customer happy. We'll generate revenue, and we'll have better innovation. 
You know, I mentioned earlier, let me see if I'm going to keep it move up. No. Sorry. I guess this one may not move. But basically, I mentioned it earlier. This isn't happening quite yet, but it's happening in the medical community. There are hospitals now, globally, that are delivering medical packages to hospitals on an as-needed basis by drone. As I mentioned earlier, just because Amazon, these retailers, have massive warehouses does not mean they're storing massive amounts of product. Heck, they couldn't keep all the product that I'm looking for because they don't know what it is, I didn't think. But what's happened is with all the data, all the AI they have, they embed the solution in such a way that the manufacturer gets told what they should manufacture based on what I'm going to ask them for a week from now. It's being packaged, it's being delivered to the unit, and that's how these companies say, we'll have it to you by 3 p.m. today. Even for jerks like me, who asked for it for 3 p.m. today when I'm in Amsterdam. And I'm not going to have it delivered here, I'm having it delivered back home. It's just the way I roll. And there's customers like that, not just mess up the system, but you kind of want to know it's there. So I called my wife, said, did it get delivered? Yes, it did. Great. I don't have to worry about that. Take it off my checklist. Save me time. This is the future of delivery. This is the future of democratized insights for better experiences. As I mentioned, you also have the ability, if you share insights with your teams, for them to create better engagements and to stand out from the other financial institutions. That is key today, because if we don't take those data and insights, then we might as well close our branches. Because if they're all doing just transactions, we can move somebody to an ATM. I'm sure most of us realize and get scared every once in a while. When you're talking about something at a party, about something you want to buy, or something you have bought, and all of a sudden, on Instagram or Facebook or somewhere, you get offered a product in that category. Because everybody listens, everything listens. My Alexa listens, my phone listens. Heck, they probably argue with each other behind the scenes to say, no, I think he's got that. He got offered it again? I laugh about it, but the reality is it's getting better and better. The key is it only works if you provide value added. I don't want to get bombarded by everything I talk about, but I do want to get connected with something I care about. Four years ago, I decided to buy a car. I bought a Jeep, or I was buying a Jeep. I thought I'd test the system. It's been a long time since I bought a car, but I know some of the ways the system works. I know that when you do a test drive in the States, they run a credit bureau that doesn't work against your credit bureau, but basically it's a ping. It says, you're buying. Upon doing that, every manufacturer and every dealer in the category I was looking started connecting with me. Hey, you know, we, I don't know if you might be in the mood magic in the mood for a car, but here we have this for you. They connect with me. No financial institution, even though the same data is available at every financial institution. I then said, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try something else. So I started posting on social media. Man, I'm looking for this kind of car. Here's the car I'm looking at. This is my favorite car. My personal bank, my business bank, no bank, no connection. I said, okay, one more chance. I went to the market, to the dealer, and I wrote a check as a down payment on my personal bank. I know that bank has the technology that they read all checks that are processed. And again, they didn't reach out to me to say, hey, can we do the loan for you? What happened was, I went to the finance manager at the, bank, at the dealership, got a loan through him, through a, another provider, ally in the States. What was interesting is there's lost opportunities when we don't use data that's available. Alexa is becoming more than a music player in my house. It's my listening device. And as long as Amazon and other companies deliver what I'm considering, it's a value transfer that's worth it. So how many of you use an online shopping uh, tool of some sort? Raise your hands. OK. Those usually cost some money. How many, have you, have you how many of you have canceled the relationship with the, the um, provider in the last three years? Nobody. Now, in the States, I pay $130 a year for Amazon Prime. You can, 
if somebody questions me, I know it's not about free delivery anymore. That's all for everybody. It's not really about music and books. I, I'll say that. I'll say, I, you know, it's because of my movie re- subscription. Basically, I'm paying $130 a year simply to have be known because they do so well. The value transfer is there. We, as an industry, have to be challenged because we keep on charging people, or try, I'm sorry, we keep on trying to do things for free when we should be charging. We don't have to. We provide value. We've got to continue to go down that path. You know, it's interesting because data analytics can power everything. When you're looking at the democratized data, you can improve services, you can lower costs, you can actually do more in innovation with the data analytics. You know, we also look at the fact that when you look at open banking, I want to tell you a story. I was telling this to somebody this today. I'm very fortunate that I'm able to interview people in the industry to find out what they're doing. One of the interview series I have is called Fissionaries, F-I-Genaries. Um, it's for a, a client, and they wanted me to interview small financial institutions that are doing amazing things. Last week, I interviewed a person from a small bank called Coastal Community Bank in Everett, Washington, about 30 branches, $3 billion in assets, small bank, about 30,000 customers, I think. However, you're doing embedded banking, open banking relationships. One of their relationships was with a company called One. They have about 30 different fintech partnerships and collaborations they've had over the years. They turn some on, they turn some off. One happens to be, happened to have been just bought by Walmart in the States to run their entire One financial network. So this $3 billion financial institution, 200 employees, has a relationship that provides the banking services for the biggest retailer in the United States. They could go from 30,000 customers to 300 million relationships overnight. Now, are those deep relationships? No. But they found a way to expand their marketplace because of data, analytics, AI, and innovative spirit. The one big difference for any of you that do articles, do podcasts, research companies, the one difference, and I, was one of my major things I told you at the beginning, the one major difference between those companies who are doing things special and those who are just doing what everybody else is doing is leadership. Interesting that Brett mentioned about, you know, how many banks are led by technology people? Lacasia made their name by having a technology person in charge of it. Coastal Community, $3 billion in assets, is a tech person and another tech person that joined them as president. But the chairman and the president are both tech people. And their entire organization of 200 people are behind the vision of being innovative and being different. And half their assets right now are from open banking relationships. So for all you that consider the fact that, geez, this whole open banking, this embedded banking thing is too hard to do, if a $300 billion organization, I'm sorry, $3 billion organization with 200 employees can do it, you can do it. What's also interesting is as we look forward to the democratization of data, the application of experiences, we have to look at the metaverse. If you're even thinking about the metaverse, you can't do it without data, analytics, and AI. It's the foundation upon which everything else is built. The same bank I was just talking about, Coastal Community in Everett, Washington, has something called Coastal World. I'd recommend you look at it. It's a metaverse banking environment that they put out there, and they're building insights as they go along. Those insights are, how do people engage? What are they looking for? What do they want more of? What do they want less of? Their metaverse environment is actually going to set the tone for the way they do all kinds of banking. So their innovation on their traditional bank is being done, driven by the insights they're getting from their metaverse endeavor. You know, I don't know how many financial institutions in this room could get senior management to agree to building a metaverse environment, a virtual reality environment for a bank just to test. But that's what it takes. Do you have a challenger spirit? Do you have what it takes to become the bank of the future? 
do you have an organization that's going to inspire innovation? Because if you're not, you're going to be left behind. In addition, what we have found in our research for the Digital Banking Report is the best companies to succeed right now seem to be the smallest and the largest. The largest because they got the money to make mistakes. The smallest because they have leadership that's willing to take risks to be different. Middle-sized banks, and I'm going to irritate somebody here, but I, I've given up that hope for a long time ago. Many mid-sized banks are still being led by a team of white men that played golf together when they started management training and have gone through the ranks together, doing very well at what they do, patting each other on the back, but not willing to embrace change, take risks, and disrupt their organization for the future. Yes, we've let in outsiders, but we still think like a bunch of white men in a boardroom patting each other on the back. I was one of those. You need to want change. You need to do behavioral change, be it in a personal life or in a business life, to be able to make moves. The key is here, you don't have time to wait. You need to move now. The rocket chain, the bullet train has left the station, and you need to get on that train. If you don't, it will be left behind. It's not like the next one, you can pick up the next one. Every minute you lose, it's harder to catch up. So, Change has never happened this fast, and as I mentioned, it will never happen this slowly again. You need to determine if you know the customer, if you understand them, if you're willing to reward them for their services. You need a seamless integration of data, analytics, AI, to be able to drive experiences like none of your competitors. It requires leadership thinking that is different than what we've had in the past deliver services that are different in the past. It takes a major paradigm change. Are you ready to embrace change? Are you ready to take risks? Are you ready to disrupt yourself and your organization? Are you ready for the future? And are you willing to do what it takes besides going to a great conference? The opportunities are endless. The challenges are many. We're talking about banking transformed. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.